All right, so that's my classroom. I teach uh, in the University of Illinois. That's not really a classroom, it's, uh, it's a building, right? That's, uh, that's a classroom with my students. I have about 975 students in two sections of 975 students. Um, so my students will come to this website. The website is divided uh, among different subjects, right? All the subjects are representative of a week. A week is a chapter. So here's how it works. So um, they have to complete two parts. The first part is called a pre-lecture assignment. This is a series of animated lectures um, that last about a minute and a half each. Now, it's, uh, they won't be able to advance to the following scene until they actually click on the previous scene. When they get to the end of that scene, then they, they the link for the previous scene, for the next scene, comes alive. Now, at some point, they're going to see a question, and that question is going to be uh, low stakes. They have to answer it correctly in order to keep moving forward on, this, on the pre-lecture. If they get it wrong, they get some feedback. When they get it right, they move forward. Uh, the, Lesson is designed to take about 15 minutes of their time, including answering the questions. They get credit for completing the session. Uh, the second thing they have to do is what I call a bridge question. And this is just a series of multiple choice questions that are kind of very challenging. They don't get the answer to that question until they come to class. So I'm going to try to share with you some of the things I've learned by taking it from the perspective of the things I've heard that are really not true about the idea, this idea that, that I'm using, which for better or worse is called a flipped classroom, OK? Uh, so the first thing I usually hear uh, is that, which is what I did, is that students can actually, you can flip the classroom by assigning the textbook, and they will read it, and I can just do something else in class. But they were looking at the problem, trying to answer it by trial and error first. Okay, they try it twice. It, can't go, it doesn't work. Okay, so now maybe I can just look at, look at Google and find the answer that way. They were going from the reverse engineering perspective, which is completely not the way I thought they were going to do. I thought they were going to approach it by, you know, looking at this textbook and, you know, reading the whole thing. But, you know, the thing that like, textbooks have a lot of, they have a lot of pages, right, with tables and... It turns out that is not the best way to provide information to novices for the first time. There's a lot of discussion um, you know, about, well, I mean, the students don't read the textbook because there's a problem with this textbook, but this textbook, they will read it, uh, or this textbook, no, it's another textbook, they will read it because it's more relevant. And I'm going to argue today that the reason they don't read the textbook before class is because it's just the wrong media. It's the textbook, so we should just give up. Okay? And, and find something else provided the media in a different way. So when you think about what the students are doing, they're coming to your class and choosing themselves to come to your class without any textbook because they like the way you present the materials to them on the board for the first time to them. And again, uh, you can do it with videos, or you can do it with shock and talk. It's essentially the same thing. The special thing, and the reason this is a better way for humans, particularly novices, to, to receive information for the first time is because, as Eric said at the beginning, it's because that is the way cognitive scientists know we learn. We receive a message through the through two channels, the auditory channel and the visual channel, and when we can complement those channels, then we can maximize the reception. What I'm suggesting today is that perhaps the class time is not the best place for that uh, shock and talk lecture because now we have the technology to actually do it in a different way. All right. So uh, Eric and I wanted to test this, so we brought students for the laboratory, about 100 of them, and we actually divided them into random into two groups, and half of them read a textbook. Uh, um, I should say it was Mancuse textbook, right? And the, um, and the other half of the students actually watched uh, the multimedia videos, and then we give them an exam, the same exam to both of them. So after, right after the exam, the students who watched the video score a lot higher. Uh, we went back to the lab, and by that time, the difference had been already 10 I points. So um, what I take from this is that the, the video is really working better for them to receive the message, but it's also working better for them to remember it. All right, so again, the main takeaway here is that to have second that you're thinking of flipping your classroom, um, I think you should consider not getting rid of, uh, of the lecture completely, all right? Oh, the second thing is that students will not do uh, any work before class. Well, this is not really what I have found out. Um, when I show you that description of how those pre-lecture works, I told you that I can control how they advance through the scenes by not giving them access to one scene until they watch the, first, the previous one. But they can always cheat, right? They can move the cursor all the way to the end and you know, get, that, get to do it that way. If they do it that way, they will take about you know, three or four minutes to complete it, and I give them 10% of the grade for doing all these pre-lectures, right? So it's a, lot of, it's a lot of them, and they do it before class. Um, but I, you know, I, I design it so it only takes about 15 to 20 minutes, right? So how many of them are not cheating? Right? How many of them are choosing to actually watch the pre-lectures? Well, I say, how many of them are doing half of what I imagine they will do, which is about 10 minutes? Well, 80% of them are choosing on their own 
to actually watch their pre-lectures. And about, you know, about, you have about 10% perhaps those people are actually doing less than 10 perhaps those people at Shini. So what that tells me is that they're actually, I give them credit, but they're actually doing it because they want to do it, all right? Which is completely a uh, crazy idea. Okay, so the third uh, myth is that it takes uh, too much time. Well, this is actually not really a myth, it's true, 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 all right? Um, I actually uh, transfer all my lectures to, um, uh, to videos, and I put all those videos on YouTube, and it's all those videos, and it's like too bad, there's moving really slow, so you will never get to the end of, of this. There's about, uh, there's about 100 videos here. That was my complete class. I offer it to them um, before, um, before it. This, I took count of this. This took me about six months of full-time work. I done, um, you know, surveys with other people anecdotally. Actually, in fact, yesterday I talked to a, a person here that tell me something very similar. If you flip your classroom, you record all your videos, how long did it take you? About six months of full-time work. So if you want to do it on your own, I feel pretty confident with that estimate. Uh, now, uh, fortunately, um, you don't have to do it, right? Um, that's the reason why Eric and I developed this, so you can actually get it out of the box. So this is an out-of-the-box system. Okay, so I also heard this a lot. I mean, if we actually recall all our videos out there, then, um, then why, would, why would anyone come to a classroom? Right? Why would they come to class? This is like professional suicide. Well, um, I think this is a perfect conference to make the argument that this is a myth, because all of you obviously here, because you care about this, so uh, you know that since you're good at this, if we give you uh, better technology, you actually get better at it, right? So we have all seen all of these wonderful examples of what to do in the classroom uh, if you actually decide to do active learning. Here's another question I do to talk about production. So I'm having a little bit of fun, right, with the question and trying to uh, justify students. There's clearly not a perfect answer to this question. There could be multiple answers. In fact, the students split themselves. But then they tell me what the answer. If you're looking for material for your class, your own students cannot be beat, all right? So here's what, uh, what someone who actually shows A said um, this semester. Okay, so not exactly economics. Uh, here's the second one. Now, I always wonder where is this research, right? I want to find out. Uh, what research actually say this. Uh, here's another one, which actually, this is actually one of my favorite because there's so much economics here, right? This is exactly what I was going after. Um, now, here's my all-time favorite, and this is not this semester. This was actually two semesters ago. It was so good. I always tell people, I wish I knew this when I was single. <laughs> there's no way I could have come this with, with this, right? If I knew this when I was single, I would have been a lot more luckier in my uh, search, right? Um, so this is only happen because the students are doing work before class and because you have a, a, an effective way of analyzing this. All right, so the last one is, um, I'm coming, bringing it all behind, um, is to really think about uh, the flip the classroom um, terminology, right? So if you think that flip the classroom is just basically um, you know, putting your lectures online, you're not getting the whole picture, okay? So I'm gonna offer you a, a new definition of flipping the classroom, which I think even, I think um, probably most of what my Mark would probably agree with me. Uh, the flip classroom part is really this. So what you're flipping is not by putting your lectures online. The flipping means turning your class from a teacher-centered class or from a teacher-centered course to a student-centered course. It's a course in which the students themselves are responsible for their own learning. This is why the active learning part works so well. If you think about flipping the classroom that way, then you have to think about whether it's true, but the previous ones that you really are, are we gonna become obsolete? Are we gonna become a typewriter? Which was, the last one was built in 2010, by the way, right? It was replaced very quickly, and we, we know this is a good thing, right? Technology make things better and cheaper. So now this is a classroom in the late 1800s. That's the classroom today. So I think that this technology is not going to replace necessarily uh, us in the classroom, definitely none of us here that care about education. I really think what the flip the classroom is going to do is to uh, replace the classroom itself. And when the uh, instructor becomes the center, uh, doesn't, it's not the center anymore, you, do, you have to make the students involved, you have to do active learning, then you need classrooms like that. Uh, so what I'm going to do now to kind of give a further proof is to give you another example of an activity I do in class to kind of illustrate um, this idea. And as I show you this activity, as I invite you to my class because you will see how it happens in my class, I want you to think about these questions of whether you can replicate what I'm going to show you online, okay? Uh, so, um, so here's what I do in my class when I talk about game theory about two weeks before the exam. 
I give an extra point question. So it's a real extra point. And I think you probably know this already. It's not a, I didn't come up with this. I said, if uh, you're going to have two choices, to collude or to defect, and you're going to vote with your clickers. If everyone colludes, everyone gets 10 points in the exam. Now, if everyone um, colludes and one person defects, then that person gets 50 points in the exam. And these are real points, all right? I will give them these points. As you know, you know the catch, right? The catch is that if, um, if more than one person defects, no one gets anything, okay? They are going to vote with this question uh, with the clicker. So they're gonna, I'm going to show them that question, and uh, in the video I'm going to show you, here's what's going to happen in the video before you play it. Uh, you're going to come to, this, uh, to my classroom as I am actually showing them the results of their answer. So if you're one of my students, what do you want? Well, you want that A choice, that bar, to be 100%, because that gives you 10 points. If you have a little bit of a percent on the B choice, then you're really upset because someone really took 10 points from you, right? So, um, so they're voting with the clickers. You come into my class as they're going to see this in my class. If you can increase the volume, that probably works a little bit. This nice is a reason. points in the exam. Be nice to have 10 points, huh? The problem is that 50 is much better than 10. They're very upset. 36 people defected. All right. They're upset. They want to do it again, obviously. You guys want to do it again? Yes, sure. All right. Uh, do you want to talk among yourself? They don't want to. They just want to do it again. This time, they're going to get it, all right? So they want to do it again. So I give him a chance. I go, okay, let's do it again. Here's the result of the second one. Four people change their votes. Four people, okay? So um, now they're really upset, so they still want to do it again. I actually usually don't, you know, they want to do it right away, so I give them one or more chance. Now at some point, I'm going to start taking uh, ideas from them of what to do. Some people here want people to vote for A. They say, I want people to vote for A. Okay, we know it. He's suggesting that we pass the clicker to the next ah, person. Someone said, this is coming from them. They're saying, why don't we pass the clicker to the next person? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Want to try That's that? Yeah. But, oh, let's do it. We're going to pass the clicker to the next person. So you don't have to try, but uh, make sure you, you keep track of who you're giving it to, right? So if you want, why don't you trade clickers with the person next to you? No reason to vote A, uh, to vote B anymore. Um, Here are the results. Now, if you pass your clicker, there's no reason why you should defect now. So the choice, the chances, I think, should have been a little better, right? Oh. Two people changed their vote. Someone said, wow. Right? So when was the last time that you actually had students uh, doing these kind of things? Uh, what, what I think we make in the arguments uh, in this lecture is that none of us should be afraid that we're going to be replaced with, the, uh, um, with, with this kind of things. We're not going to become a typewriter. I certainly don't think I'm a typewriter. If I, if, if I can be replaced with a machine, I think I should. Uh, but I don't think uh, any of us will.